Hi, everyone. I'm Saba Long, host of Where the Party At, your political podcast. This is our Who Runs Atlanta series, where we can give you in-depth interviews with the candidates who are aspiring to run our city government. On the show today, we have Atlanta City Council President and mayoral candidate Felicia Moore. As a council member, Felicia has always positioned herself as the outsider, the independent thinker. She has support from all parts of the city, north, south, east, and west. The big question is, will voters choose Felicia over her flashier, friendlier opponents? We'll see. Felicia Moore, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. How are you? I'm wonderful. Wonderful out there doing what campaigns need to do, and I'm fine. Good, good. Well, we got all the hot questions for you. I'm ready. <laughs> so before we get too hot, okay. I want to start with a segment we called How Atlanta Are You? Okay. All right. So you weren't born in Atlanta, but that doesn't mean that you don't know Atlanta. Okay. Right? So first up, you've got some friends coming in town that said, Felicia, let's go out. Where do you take them? In the evening or during the day or just out, period? Just period. Well, if they haven't been to Atlanta before, I take them to the King Center. Uh, most people love to go there because, of course, we're the home of the Civil Rights Movement, and I love to take them there. Okay. Apex Museum along the way. Let them see Atlanta Daily World, Atlanta Life. That whole corridor is really a good place and now we have the civil and human rights museum so that that could be another place got it all right um your favorite meal in atlanta where do you go i guess my favorite atlanta meal would be busy bee i don't go there oh i love the 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 catfish okay and i also love their shrimp i had discovered that i didn't know they had shrimp but i really also like they're smothered chicken, fried chicken. Good. And are you drinking sweet tea, lemonade? Sweet tea for sure. Sweet, sweet tea. tea for sure. Right. Not an Arnold Palmer sweet tea. Yeah, I don't like it mixed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's say you were gifted season tickets to any Atlanta sports team. It could be the Braves. If we want to consider them an Atlanta sports team, it could be the Falcons, Atlanta United. You know, whoever. Hmm, I think it would be uh, between the Falcons and the Hawks. I love football, uh, but I like basketball as well. Okay. But if you had to pick one. I would go with the Hawks. It, go with the Hawks. Mm -hmm. All right. You're a Trey Young fan? Um, not particularly. I don't watch a lot of professional sports, so I don't okay. have any particular favorites. Got it. All right. But if you had to pick, it would be the Hawks. It would be the Hawks. All right. So Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms went viral for her mac and cheese mm -hmm. what would you go viral for if you had to cook a meal mm, that's a good question my spaghetti. spaghetti spaghetti okay tell me how that's prepared oh well it's good <laughs> <laughs> so i like to make that on my own sauce okay all right uh, so you're not doing a little canned ragu no no, okay. no 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 i like to i start from paste okay um let it simmer really well love to spice it up with a good um, Italian seasoning and some peppers. Mm -hmm. And then I like to make my like little meatballs, but I like to do that with hot Italian sausage. Okay. And Fancy. then of course, um, I used to do it with ground beef, but now I do it with ground turkey. So healthy. Fancy, but healthy. Yeah, fancy, but healthy. And okay. even the sausage is really chicken sausage or, you know, some other sausage is not pork. And what else do I put in it? Of course, the spaghetti. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's about it. And then, you know, Parmesan cheese. I love Parmesan cheese. Got it. And are you one of those people that you do you put the pasta separate from the sauce? Or no, it's you mix all, it all mixed in. Together? in. It's okay. all mixed together. So you do it the black way. <laughs> okay. If that's the black way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. All right. Well, that wraps up our segment of how Atlanta are you. Okay. We'll let the people decide. If but I'm in Atlanta or not. <laughs> I, think, I think you probably are. All right. So we'll kind of go into more of the meaty questions. Okay. All right. So people, you've been on council. You were first a council aide, and then you became a council member. So you've been in city, in and around city government mm -hmm. for a while. But I would say a lot of people may not know who you are. Like, oh, I know her as a council person, but I don't know, like, 
her background, okay. right? Um, so tell me a little bit about like baby Felicia growing up. Where did you grow up? What brought you to Atlanta? But first, just start with, you know, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I, both of my parents were products of the South. Their parents brought them through the great <laughs> migration to the North. My dad was from Alabama. My mother was from Tennessee. And they met in high school, Christmas at X High School, which is the only black high school that they could go to at the time. It, and it was, they were in the class with 1945 where they won the state championship. That's a whole other story. Where did they win the state championship? I mean, this the high school, a black high school. For for like for basketball, okay, basketball, okay, basketball. It. As a matter of fact, my mother's a twin, although her brother has passed, and he was on that team. Ah. And so uh, they met there. And so when I grew up, when I was a baby, I think we lived somewhere else. But my first memories, probably, and I actually remember around between two and four, almost five, uh, we lived not far from my grandmother, my mother's mother, and we were in a house that was rented. It was in a pretty much a low-income neighborhood, and we, we had some challenges uh, there, but my parents worked really hard. My dad was an assembly line worker. My mom was an executive secretary to the Equal Opportunity Commission. They worked hard, put their money together, and uh, built a house on the east side of Atlanta. So we moved on up to the east side, and it was a racially diverse neighborhood, mostly white at the time. But, of course, they started moving out when we started moving in. So you grew up in Atlanta? I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. Oh, I thought you said east Atlanta. No, 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 no. Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, And so we... We lived there, and I graduated from high school. And when I was a senior in high school, we took a trip around the country to historically black colleges and universities. And, of course, you know Atlanta was on the map. And uh, our girlfriend, me and my girlfriends were so excited to come to Atlanta. We heard about this place, and we devised a scheme, and we waited on our chaperones to go to sleep. And we snuck away. We got in a cab. We went down on Camelton Road in southwest Atlanta to Cisco's Nightclub. And being from Indianapolis, I walked in there and I thought I had died and woke up in Black Hollywood. I was just (laughs) like, that was it for me. I mean, don't ask me how we got in. We got in, though. And I mean, the people were beautiful. You were resourceful. Oh, yes. And they were professionally dressed. And it was just a beautiful club atmosphere. And I said, oh, if I ever move, I want to come to Atlanta. So I kept Atlanta on my mind all that time. My Aunt came to school here for her graduate degree. It was always inflection points with Atlanta and keeping up with it on the news. And I went to college at Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio, an HBCU. And I graduated cum laude with communications degree and then went home and worked for a few years there and then had an opportunity to come to Atlanta for two weeks to stay with someone to see if I wanted to move here and... I knew I wasn't going back if I got here, so I got here, and uh, I stayed. So when you moved here, where did you first move to? So when I came for the two weeks, I stayed in College Park, right by the airport, I think Sylvan Road. Then I moved to Midtown because a girlfriend that went to school with me was in Midtown, so I stayed with her for a few months. Then I bought, got my own apartment on State Street up in the attic of a house, the last house right before, at that time, it was Atlantic Steel, not Atlantic Station. So that has a whole lot of stories to it, living by the steel mill. And then I decided I want to be a homeowner. And I bought my first home in Riverside neighborhood off of Bolton Road in northwest Atlanta. And that's kind of where it started. You know, the first day I was moving in, my mom and dad drove the U-Haul from Indiana. We were unpacking, and a guy drove up in his car and said, hey, we're having a meeting tonight. We're starting a neighborhood association. My dad said, well, you go with him. Mom and I will keep unpacking. I went with him. We had the meeting. I came home and announced, Mom and Dad, I am the president of the Neighborhood Association. (laughs) This was was like your first meeting? The first day I was moving in, yes. And it started from there. I found out they were trying to burn hazardous waste as an alternative fuel source at a cement plant behind my house. So I got in that fight. Then I found out two blocks down the street they were trying to I started a landfill, and I got in that fight, and, you know, I did Crime Watch and neighborhood programs and youth programs for my neighborhood. Then people wanted me to chair the MPU, and I became chair of the MPU. 
And while I was doing that, I helped Gloria Bermel Tanubu, if you remember her from council who represented District 12. She was running, helped her win, and she asked me to come work for her at City Hall. So I was in the community, neighborhood president, MPU chair, and an aide to City Council. And that's where I really saw where what people really wanted to happen in the community and what did and didn't happen at City Hall. So that makes me, you know, think about the fact that you were a council, you've kind of had these various roles, right? So you were involved with your neighborhood association, Mm -hmm. you're involved with your NPU, then you go to work at city council, and then you become a city council member, and then now you're a council president. So along that arc of engagement, Mm -hmm. what do you think folks don't understand about city council? I think sometimes people forget their basic civics class in terms of how uh, government operates with the three branches of government, the judicial being our court system, but really the difference between what the legislative side can and cannot do and what the executive side can and cannot do based on how we are functioned. We are a strong mayor form of government. There's various forms of municipal government, but we are a strong mayor. And so that means there's a separation. Uh, in the executive branch is headed by the CEO of the city, which is the mayor of the city of Atlanta. And all of the departments of the city are under the control of the mayor in that in that line. And then the legislative side is different, and you have the president, who is not a member of council, all the members of council, and the clerk's office and research staff are, are staffing it. But we do not have direct authority over the police department or in uh, public works or any of them. But what we can do and where we have control is collectively writing laws, making policy, approving, disapproving budgets, having oversight responsibility. And of course you have, that makes gives you a platform uh, to advocate for some things or to condemn things if you don't want to, but you can't, I can't call the police chief and make him do anything that would have to come from his boss, which would be the mayor. Do you think the strong form, the strong mayor form of government has served the city well? I think it's fine. It depends on who the mayor is and how they use that power because it is a lot of power. And it depends as well. That's why it's very equally important for people to think about who the council people are because you want council people that are willing to do their job. You know, and and to really do your job, you've got to be willing to stand up to criticism. I know that I I have because I don't always go along to get along. Didn't always, you know, just do what people wanted you to do. Ask tough questions, really read legislation, push back where necessary, praise where necessary. And particularly if you don't kind of go along with what the whole team is doing, um, it can lend you into criticism. So that makes me think about the next, you know, kind of question here Mm -hmm. is as a council member, I think you were kind of seen as the loyal opposition against the administration, whichever administration that might be. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you were to become mayor, Mm -hmm. how would you handle the reverse, right? How would you handle as mayor dealing with the loyal opposition if someone mm-hmm. kind of takes that mantle that you previously had as a council member? Okay. Well, first, I don't consider myself as a loyal opposition. I, I think you can view it as someone who, again, as I just said, you know, if you really do your job, you can find yourself being portrayed in that way. Um, and so I wouldn't call myself a loyal opposition because in all things, I sought to be able to be supportive. But you've got to present things to people in a way that they can support it. Meaning, if you have a council member who requires to understand what they're voting on and understand the implications of that, then you need to provide that information. You can't expect a council member like myself uh, to vote on something that's a multi-million dollar contract or has implications for a community and just shove it in my face and say, hey, give me a yes vote. I'm not going to do that because I have a duty and a responsibility to the people I serve to make sure that I know what I'm voting for and I give it that end. So to answer your question as mayor, 
I'm sure that there will be some push and pull between the council and the mayor. That's fine. There's a check and balance. But what I won't have to contend with is the fact that people won't have the information. I want to work with the council. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to uh, treat the council the way that I've had to do. And that is get up in the morning and read the AJC to find out what's going on at City Hall, because they're going to be actively engaged and involved in what I'm doing. And I think that that's a difference that, you know, it's not going to be because somebody wants to be opposed because they can't have the information they need to make a valued decision. And they're going to know what's going on. It sounds like you're saying as as mayor, you will be more collaborative perhaps than what we've seen in previous administrations. Is that fair to say? I think that I, it's very fair to say that when I ran for city council, I said to myself, I want to be the council member I want to have. I'm running for mayor and I'm going to want to be the mayor that I want to have. And that's one that is collaborative, one that opens it up. I would love for the council, maybe on a quarterly basis or at least twice a year, to actually come to and attend a cabinet meeting so they can see the nuts and bolts of what's going on. Because we have a lot of issues facing us. And I'm going to need the council to be supportive so that we can get some of these things done. And the best way for someone to be supportive, if they truly understand the gravity of the situation and what needs to happen to get it done, other than, you know, me coming up with what I want and then serving it to them, say, hurry up and vote on it. I think there's a difference. And I know that I'm... I'm just off of the council coming from the president and as uh, a a 20 year council member, I know where the failures are in the communication across the hall and I'm not going to repeat those things. So what would you say are your first 100 day priorities? Oh, well, first and foremost, we've got to work on uh, the public safety issue, Uh, making sure that every neighborhood across the city is safe. How do you actually do that? Well, I have five areas that I'm going to focus on. I call it my five C's. And some of them are are long term and then some of them are short term. Uh, The first one I like to focus on is more something that we start to build a foundation for the future. And that's dealing with our children. There's... um, a great need for us to, for the city to partner with our school system. And I know everybody, when they run, they say that, but actually doing something. And I'm certainly hopeful that we will get the reciprocation from the school board. Many, so what, I, what would that look would, like? What it, would collaboration with school board look well, like? And the, uh, yeah, I mean, I have ideas on what I'd like to see done. I'm sure they may have some as well. One idea is, you know, we have recreation centers and we have schools in some of our more tra- challenged neighborhoods. Why can't we, and I would like to start it as a pilot and then see if we can expand it match a school or schools with one of our recreation centers and see if we can get the school system to drop the kids off there at our at our recreation center after school help them with their homework feed them a meal expose them to stem activities recreation whatever the kids want to do not what we as adults think they want to do and then later the school system agrees to come pick them up and take them home And why is that important? It's important to me because kids are being let out of school. They go home, mom, dad, grandmother, whoever their guardian is, is probably not there because they're at work. If we can keep our arms and eyes on these kids and keep them engaged, I think that that will be helpful. I also think there are other ways that we can partner with our school system. You know, I would love to bring back officer friendly so kids can in, engage with our officers on a on a different level than seeing people be arrested. Uh, I would like to also see that um, maybe we can work with our unions to see if we can get them connected with our schools so we can bring some trades. And if we can't do it at the school, we don't have to wait on them. We can do that at some of our recreation centers. It doesn't always have to be about fun and games. But I know that for me as a child, when I found things that I was excited about and interested in, it kept my attention. And we have got to keep these kids' attention and build maybe even our workforce for the future. I'd love to see 
our kids to come and tour City Hall, tour our wastewater treatment plants so they know where where the water goes when they flush their toilet, tour our water plants, tour our public work facilities, you know, get them interested and excited about the city, maybe wanting to be police officers or firefighters. I mean, I think that there are many ways that we can intersect uh, with our school system, getting them work workforce development, getting them jobs. Kids want to make money these days, you know. So there are many ways that we can intersect and work with our school system. But I just want to say this. I don't want to stop with the kids because I think that's one part. The other part is we've got to strengthen the families. Um, Many of these kids are with single mothers who really need help and support. And so what can we do to help them maybe get in apprenticeship programs with our unions and be able to make an above living wage job and then helping them maybe get their first home ownership because that's important. You know, I wanted to be a homeowner because I know my mom and dad worked hard to scrape to get that house I said that they built. Uh, and so you start a, a breaking that cycle of poverty in, in, in the mindset of the kids as well as with the family so they can start building wealth. So that's a long-term solution. But if we don't start on that now, in 20 years, you'll I, I don't know if it'll be you or someone will be sitting with the next mayoral candidate and we'll be dealing with the same issues. So that's one of the one of the five C's. I can go through all of them if you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first 100 days, you've got public safety as a priority collaboration with the school district as a priority and anything else that you well I mean on on the on the I'll just briefly mention them on the public safety piece the other five C's are dealing with our officers making sure that we can get more of them on the street but also meaning that we can take some of the pressure off of them with a 24 hour seven day a week response team that can deal with behavior on mental health issues getting new leadership in the department incentivizing some of those officers that left to come back um, and also seeing if we can get more of the administrative staff out on the streets so that we can build up presence while we're trying to recruit and train. What, what do you say to the person who says we have enough officers, the o- officers isn't the thing, right? Well, there I, are other ways that you can tackle the public safety challenge. Well, and, and if, if, you know, there are other ways and I believe my first see the children is one of the, one of the ways, the other ways are dealing with the mental health issues. And as I was just getting ready to say, you know, having the officers is great and they do their job. They arrest people, but we also have to deal with our court system and provide opportunities there for them to allow them to use our jail. So that's not an excuse to let repeat and violent offenders out. Also using our workforce development agency to provide training for people who are first offenders, even for those who have been convicted, seeing if we can get them uh, trained to do something so they can be productive members of society, you know, providing that option. Of course, it's an individual's decision whether they take it or not, but if they don't, you know, we know what the result of that will be, but we can provide um, what we can from the city standpoint to help them. So the other, the, I want to get my other two C's in and just briefly, the other one is, you know, code enforcement around our bars and nightclubs because we've had a lot and of activities. Just explain what that is for folks. So, you familiar. know, we've had a lot of activities um, of violent shootings and, and violence and just a lot of issues around our bars and nightclubs, restaurants and lounges. And I love me a nightclub. As you know, they brought me to Atlanta uh, and It brings great revenue to the city. So I want us to keep having that thriving nightlife. But I even hear complaints from those who are following the rules, you know, making sure they're keeping their noise down, making sure they're having proper security, uh, watching out for their capacity issues. But they know most of the bad actors know that no one's going to do anything. And so they just continue on. And so what I found uh, when the council asked for an audit, half of the positions to just regulate them are vacant. So we want to get those. uh, Why do you think that is? Well, I don't know why it didn't, but I I will say in my platform, I talk about our our departments and there's not a one of them that's not uh, in bad shape. And just mismanagement, 
dysfunction, facilities bad, equipment down. You know, we do the big things good in Atlanta, like the stadiums and all the great things, but we really haven't paid attention to our foundation of city services, and we need to get those up. So and then, and let a... me just say my last C, because sure. I know it's five. So that's code enforcement is one, and then the last one is a, a community effort. Just like I said, when I was a neighborhood president, you know, we need to get our crime watches back in our neighborhood, neighbors watching out for neighbors, businesses, apartment complex, all of these people participate. Everybody has a role to play in this. And so that's the five C's. Now, I'll all let right. You go all right. Five <laughs> C's are done. So you mentioned uh, kind of departmental dysfunction, and mm-hmm. you know, city, general city dysfunction. Where does, where do you put the fault? Is that the mayor's office? Is it the cabinet member that is not leading? Like, how do you, how do you fix that? Who's at fault and how do you fix it? Well, ultimately it becomes a responsibility of the mayor. So as, when I'm mayor, it will be my responsibility, no matter who did or didn't do something. And, you know, I've been around city government for a while, so I've seen it declining over the years. We've done a good job of putting band-aids in certain spots, you know, when things hit, but I believe we're getting at a point where it's just kind of crumbling the infrastructure of our service delivery. And if we don't stop and really pay attention to it, it's going to be more difficult down the line for future um, administration. So I think it's just been a gradual deterioration. It's like, you know, that gutter that's full of leaves that you don't attend to after a while, it starts damaging property. And the longer you ignore it, the more damage it's done. So what does it cost to a lot. get that up? I believe it's going to cost a lot, but I, you know what I'm going to do, uh, and this is something in that first 100 days, I'm going to be talking to all of the heads of the departments. I want to know what are the top three things that keep you up at night, uh, and then give me the other 10 that you know need urgent attention so we can do a very quick assessment of you know, what needs to happen. Because even as a council member or a council president on the legislative side, we don't always get the benefit of knowing what's really going on at City Hall because it's ran by the other side of the house. So we need to know, get that quick assessment and then we'll do a more deeper dive assessment and how we can address it because some of it's going to be capital cost and others of it is going to be uh, personnel changes. So... What's at stake in this election? I believe everything. I think the future of the city is at stake because, you know, we have celebrated and kind of read over. We had some rough times during the recession and we we had a good uptick in the economy. So we're riding the wave with the rest of the country. But because city service delivery is low and or non-existent in some instances and The number one threat, I think, is our brand, particularly with the safety issues, public safety issues. If we don't address those, we can find ourselves slipping in a downward spiral. Uh, We haven't. You also have Buckhead Cityhood. We have Buckhead Cityhood. We have our airport. And we still are number one in income inequality in the city. And we haven't addressed that. I mean, there are just so many major issues that the can has been kicked down the road so far that now it's hit a wall. And we need to stop and deal with them. Um, It's probably fair to say that, at least according to the polls, you're neck and neck with former Mayor Kasim Reed. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the person that's on the fence and they're not quite sure? We've got, what, 30-something percent Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of voters who are undecided in this election. What do you say to them? Between us? Sure. If it's, it seems like it's going to be yes, a runoff yes, between the yes. two of you. So. Well, I think, you know, Mayor Reese says it's best. You know, he said he's done it before. He'll do it again. And and points to those things that he thinks are accomplishments in his administration. But I believe people need to also remember those things that we're still dealing with. And that is the cloud of corruption that we have over city government. And I believe integrity matters. When you are facing a lot of tough decisions in the city, public trust is going to be essential for us to move forward. And I've served with integrity and will continue to do so as mayor. And I believe that we're going to see a lot of the contents of this cloud of corruption uh, start to expel themselves over the next year 
because we have trials that are coming up. I believe more indictments will come down, subpoenas. You know, we've spent $30 million in counting uh, just on one expense, and that's outside legal counsel. That's not counting other funds that may have spent money, our city employees' time, and resources that we've spent. We could do a lot with $30 million. We can fix maybe one of those departments, fix a facility, get the equipment. Um, I, I think it's not smart for us to go back uh, to administration that caused us this and will be there sort of presiding over it as it really heats up. Um, it's a distraction. So that's the point I was trying to make, a distraction from a lot of the major issues we got to deal with. Got it. So for the younger voter who, you know, maybe they just kind of saw the highlight reel and it's like, mm -hmm. oh, during Kasim's administration, the city seemed to be thriving. Mm -hmm. You know, we're the Black Mecca, Black Hollywood, all of that. And they may not have paid attention to any of the mm -hmm. issues that you just mentioned. How do you differentiate yourself for them? And I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the voter who like likes the shine, right? Like, oh, I like I like that mm -hmm. so and so celebrity is endorsing, or I like that mm -hmm. you know the former mayor is seen with, I don't know, name, insert rapper, insert Hollywood person. Mm -hmm. How do you differ? How do you get them to vote for you over the person that seems kind of like cool and hip? Well, if cool and hip is what they're attracted to and because you're seen with a celebrity or an influencer and that's what you use in your decision-making process to vote, I don't think that I can change that. Uh, because I'm not a celebrity mayor and I'm not going about this about celebrity or to be with celebrities. I'm doing it because as I started out in my neighborhood up to where I am now, I really want to serve this city and make this city work. And so I, what I would say to them is a celebrity is great, but someone who's going to be doing the work is better because you want this city to be great. And you're probably proud of your city and you're, People are proud of you and happy about you because you live in Atlanta. Well, there's a lot of hard work to be done that's not the most glamorous things to do. And somebody needs to be committed to do it and not be, uh, you know, busy trying to be with paparazzi and and all of that. So, you know, I can, I, I'm okay with a little shine and I like celebrities too, but I'm about here to do the hard work. And I think you have to have people that are willing to do that. And I would hope that they would think beyond the bling and think about the real thing that's important to the city. And that's making it safe, making it work and uh, making sure that we have a great brand that is not a brand of corruption. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about the transition that you would be making from mm -hmm. council president, which has never happened. So if you become mayor, you would break the curse of council presidents uh, attempting to become the mayor what is different? Like, how do you, what's different in your approach from being a council president to becoming the CEO of the city? It's a big difference. And it was a big difference becoming a, from council member to council president. And I understand the nature and the role of the mayor because I've dealt with many. And I don't know all of it, but you, you know, I'm sure there are things that you know, just like when I came into president or council member, and then you find out the things that you don't. Um, there will be a big transition, but I'm not going to be doing it alone. And I always believe this, the, the stupidest person is the one they think that thinks they know everything. And I don't know everything. And so I'm going to have good people around me um, that I can help advise me and help get me through it. We have plenty of former mayors still around that I'm sure uh, if I called them and asked for their assistance or guidance or advice would give it to me. And we have plenty of people who have worked with other mayors as they made that transition. And even all of the issues we have with the city, Saba, one day I was sitting at home and I said, Felicia, you're running for mayor. Right. And then I started thinking about all of these I've challenges. All of this yeah. Stuff. yeah. Challenges that we had. And just when you would say, Oh my goodness, what did I get into? This breath of fresh air came over me because I thought about how great Atlanta is and its people. We have institutions of higher learning here. We have great philanthropic community, nonprofits, churches. I mean, 
the list goes on and on. So we really have all we need to to address all of these various issues in different ways. What's missing? What's missing is the leadership and the mayor, which I'm going to be, that's going to call them to the table and let them have that piece of the pie that needs to be fixed and let them help us and work with them to get it done. I really want to make sure, because I know that as council member over the years and even as president, I have met numerous people who have wanted to offer something to the city or help the city in some way, but they felt like they could never get through the door. Well, I'm going to have the door open and we're going to work with everyone that can bring value to the city and particularly help us address the issues that we have. Do you think the Atlanta way works? Um... Which Atlanta way? Because you know what? When I hear people use that, they use it in different scenarios. So tell me your Well, your I mean, the Atlanta way, uh, the, well, there are many, uh, but I believe you're asking about the diversity of the city and us working together, the racial relations. Um, I think it has to work. And I believe we need to get back to it because, you know, we're talking about... Is it working today? Today, no. And I don't think the Atlanta way is working anywhere. Unfortunately, we're in an environment now nationally and otherwise where human beings are seeking to find ways to divide themselves instead of work together. And so Atlanta Way has to come back and it has to be a mayor that's wanting to unify the city and work to unify the city and respectful of everyone's opinion. Um, but making sure that we're going in a common direction. I did that for 20 years. I represented District 9. It has a large Latino population, but it also is the one that they say goes from Buckhead, actually, to Bankhead, to Bankhead which is Donnelly Hollowell Parkway. And so I've dealt with people with different income brackets, different races, different cultures, and was able to work with them and in some instances, was able to bridge that gap and get them to come together. And that's what we're going to need. We're going to need to get back to the Atlanta way. I don't think it's totally lost, but I do think we need to find a way to make it even better. What do you think folks don't understand about you? Hmm. I don't think that people understand that I'm sincere about what I do, um, that I'm really serious about what I do and and I take it seriously you know we talked earlier about how people say you called me the loyal opposition I think that's an easy well well, I mean you use that term and other people have used that term and I think they put me in that box as if oh she just wants to vote no on everything but they I don't think that they truly understand that I'm making principal votes and I'm voting no for them I'm voting no to make sure that this process works for everybody. I'm voting no because we need to know what's what we're doing in city government. And I, I'm putting my heart and so and I'm I'm taking all of the arrows and everything that comes along with it for doing that. You know, I believe you know, this is an anonymous quote that I love is you stand up for what's right even if you're standing alone. And I've stood alone quite a bit. But I'm willing to do that if I know I can go home and sleep well at night and know that I've done the best that I could. And so I think sometimes people just uh, don't get me. They don't get that I'm really doing it for an honest reason. I remember. uh, It's not out of spite or anything. No, it's not even about the person or the personality. Because, I mean, we can argue today. And once I'm through with the argument, you know, we can go do whatever we want to do. I'm just not a vengeful type of person. I leave that to the Lord. I don't. I'm, I don't I don't hold that kind of stuff. That's just not me. And I think people really misunderstand me because they don't want to get to know me. And people also love to listen to the whisper campaigns. Uh, and there's a lot of them about me that are totally untrue and unfounded. But people want to set the narrative on who I am. But it's so wrong. And I'm so glad you asked that question. People just don't understand that I, I really mean this. And, and and one example is there was someone we were talking and I was explaining who, who I was. And she said, well, you're just too good to be true. So I think people, because we can become so cynical in political realm, that people truly don't believe that out of all of the politicians, which I don't call myself a politician, I call myself a public servant in a political environment. I recognize the environment I'm in, but I'm really there to serve. I think that people 
just assume that no one is really sincere about serving people and doing what they think is in their best interest. And that's not just, I mean, that that's not just at the local level. That's everywhere. It's everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. There's, there's just, and, and many people who are elected government. don't help it either. Yeah. Because they're distrustful and they do distrustful things. And after a while, people assume that's what an elected official is, whether you're a good one or a bad one. You got, you're too good to be true if you're just trying to be honest because they're not honest. You're too good be, to be true if you say you're telling the truth because they lie. And you just get caught up in a generalization. And then when you're the unicorn, so to speak, in that generalization, people don't want to believe it. Yeah. Um, just, you know, as we kind of wrap up, we're in the heat of the campaign. Mm hmm. There's a lot going on. You know, the debates are getting spicy. Uh, the gloves are coming off, so to speak. What is it that really, I guess the question might be around um, you, you, the, I'll talk about this one. The police endorsed the previous mayor, mm -hmm. which I think may have surprised folks. The fire, firefighters also endorsed the previous mayor. Um, so how do you, how do you respond to that as someone who's you've been on council and I've for... been a supporter of both of them <laughs> for all of the time that I've been there. Uh, I've, and you know, I'm surprised as well, but then that's the politics of the situation. Clearly he promised them things that um, they were attracted to and they endorsed him. So do you think like, how do you, what's the line between Sometimes you just have to get political and then other times you are kind of sh straight down the middle, you know, not mm -hmm. taking one side or another. Like th that's going to be a tension. Mm -hmm. If you are to become mayor, that's going to be a tension that you will have to contend with on a daily basis. So how do you handle the balance of not being overly political, but still getting what you need done? Well, I want to, my goal is to get things done. And People I want to do sometimes need to be incentivized. Well, let me, let me finish my statement. I want to get things done and I want to do it in the way that I would want any mayor to handle me as a, uh, or deal work with me as a council member and other people to get things done. I like to be fair. I like to be open. I like to be transparent. I like to be collaborative. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm a pushover and it doesn't mean I'm going to sit back and let the city fail because people don't want to get along. You're going to get all the information you need. You're going to get all the justification you're going to need. And then if you need to be incentivized, I'll do that too. But that's not my first start. I'm not coming in there to reign over anybody. I'm not coming in to be a bully. I'm not coming in there to do a lot of things in the ways that I've seen them done. I'm not here to horse trade. I'm not doing all that. I want us all to be on the same page. We don't have to agree how we get there, but we're going to make this city better. Got it. And, you know, again, just kind of as we wrap up, mm -hmm. um, you know, A Atlanta, just kind of back on this like Hollywood thing, A Atlanta is seen as the spot, like it's the spot to hang out. You got celebrities come mm -hmm. here. You know, the previous few mayors have always had celebrities kind of circling around mm -hmm. in and out of city hall. Is there, are you going to be kind of, you know, I'm I'm the serious person who gets the job done mm -hmm. or will we, will we see folks coming in and out of city hall? Well, I certainly hope so. I love celebrities is, is, too. <laughs> is Jay-Z, is Jay-Z invited? Is T.I. invited to city hall? Or are you oh. like, and I ask this because I think sometimes think, Oh, Felicia Moore is like uber serious, mm -hmm. right? And, I am serious. But you are person. a person like you, you're someone who I'm sure likes to have fun too. Mm -hmm. So what is that tension or is that balance going to be between, oh, Atlanta is not a fun city if Felicia's mayor? Well, I don't think that the mayor not being fun, and I don't know people, then again, that goes to people not knowing me. Um, you, you know, how did I get to Atlanta? Felicia turns up. Yeah, well, <laughs> I do, and I can dance, so watch out. I mean, I started out <laughs> coming to, attracted to Atlanta at a nightclub, and I, yeah. and when I got here, I visited them all. <laughs> so, you know, I enjoy get, having parties. I enjoy entertainment. I enjoy music. I enjoy all of that. 
And uh, you you might catch a few videos on me of, of dancing. I mean, I like to dance. I'm not against celebrities. I like celebrities and I want to meet them. But I'm going to do the work too. So I think there's not something that either or. It's welcoming people who are known. Uh, welcoming people who are helping make this city great, our music industry, our recording artists, our movie industry, doing all that, but also getting the work done. Because for them to be able to thrive in this city, this city has got to work. They want to get their their nice, beautiful cars down our streets without having to get an alignment every day because it's a pothole. You know, if they live in the city of Atlanta <laughs> and they have yard trimmings, they want them picked up. Right. Right. If they call 911, they want somebody to pick up the phone. So they want me to do my job, too. Yeah. So, and I, I ask that because you've got, you know, studio ordinances and, and uh, you, you had mentioned earlier uh, nightclubs and, and noise and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you know, how do you address concerns of like, oh, you're going to shut stuff like that down? I'm not shutting anybody down who's following the rules. I mean, I think right now we have a code. It's under review. Council asked for that review because they were getting inundated with uh, complaints. And so there are people who have clubs who are operating um, by the rules and they're complaining because their business is being impacted by somebody that's not. So we just want everybody to follow the rules and we're going to have a party. Last question in the party mm -hmm. vein. Do you see at any point... I, I believe Atlanta has technically uh, correct me where the correct the, the correct lingo here. Did we decriminalize marijuana in Atlanta? Is that right? Yes, we did. Would that continue under if you were to become mayor? Yeah, I don't have any um any reason to change that. Um, so if you have less than an ounce, as I tell people, just keep your happiness to under an ounce <laughs> and then you'll get a ticket uh, as opposed to being arrested. And I don't see where anybody would want to change that right now. It hasn't cost us any problem. Do you think eventually the state should just make it legal and tax it? I think that the marijuana will eventually become legal across the country because what's happening when people are doing it in silos and states and the federal government still has a law saying it's, you know, a controlled substance, at some point there's going to be a tipping point where they're going to have to deal with it. And the states will probably start, more states will start doing it. You know, we're still in the Bible Belt, so I think we will be slow to... But we're in a Bible Belt that wants to legalize gambling. I know. So... It's not much different. I, I I'm not su I'm not <laughs> suggesting, but well, they haven't done it yet. Yeah. With, other than the lottery, that is still that's gambling. right. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, so just again, as we wrap up here, you're the council president. Mm -hmm. You will soon no longer be council president. Correct. What are you looking for in the next council president? Well, I think what I'm looking for, and I haven't had a good time to make my own decision on what I will do. Um, but I think knowing, well, not I think, I know having been in the position of council president at a time when we had a mayor that was may have left before the term was up if he, she went with Biden, it, it makes you think back to that one duty of a council president that most people just negate, and that's serving in the absence of a mayor. And so I'm going to be looking at someone that I vote for that I think if something happened to the next mayor would be the mayor of the city. And I think citizens need to really start being more uh, critically thinking about who the president is. I should have asked you this earlier and I didn't, mm -hmm. you were the first person to file mm -hmm. to challenge Keisha mm -hmm. um, before we knew if she was you know, we didn't know she was not going to run for reelection. Why did you feel so compelled uh, to mm -hmm. challenge the incumbent, which is something that doesn't happen often. Yeah, people, some people thought I was a little crazy. But again, it goes back to the question you asked me about who I am and what I, you know, what I'm about. And I'm about service. And when I'm council president and I'm fielding calls, because I'm very accessible to people uh, at one o'clock on two o'clock and four o'clock in the morning of people who are victims of crime, who are crying, who can't get to 911, who are having issues. And then I'm hearing more because I'm very much in touch with the people who pick up your trash right. and 
fill the potholes when I'm hearing more and more from them because they have my phone number too about the deteriorating state of their departments. I just felt like, you know what, I can't just continue to sit here for another four years and be president and keep saying I'm sorry and passing them off to someone in the executive branch and hope that they will help. I just felt that I needed to get up and grab the wheel and uh, steer the city in a better direction. And I couldn't do that from president seat. And I was willing uh, not to be elected if I was not successful. Final question, mm -hmm. I promise. Uh, let's say that you are elected and you serve two terms. Mm -hmm. So at the end of that eight years, what does Atlanta look like under your leadership? Well, it looks a lot different. One. I'm going to break up a lot of the culture that I see in city government and I don't think it's productive. Um, I'm going to set an example as mayor of how we can communicate internally um, as well as externally so that people will expect that. I'm going to have served with integrity so people will expect their leadership and their elected officials uh, to be honest. I will um, get our foundation back intact for service delivery. And that's going to take eight years to really get it going. But the most important thing that I want to be known for is starting the work on bridging this income inequality that we have in the city. One thing I've heard all the years that I have been elected, and it, I will not let that be my legacy, is that we've had black leadership in this city for over 40 years and we still have neighborhoods and people in a poverty state in this city. So I'm going to at least start that work. I won't be able to finish it in eight years, but I'm certainly going to start that work so the next mayor can take the mantle and go forward. Uh, income inequality is, if you address income inequality, you address every other issue. Yes, it's a foundation city. of the issue. And there are too many families and generations that have been in this city that have just turning in the, their wheel in the same rut. And I want to start to help build them to get up out of that rut and develop programs and activities, what we can do from the city resources to help them. Got it. Well, thank you, Felicia. Thank you for having me. Great conversation. Likewise. Hello, I'm Felicia Moore, and I want to be our next mayor. You know, we have an issue in this city with crime. And I want to make sure that every neighborhood is safe across this city, no matter what your income bracket or zip code. I want to make sure that we get the city services that we deserve and we pay for. And I want to make sure that we have a transparent government so that you know how your money is being spent and it's not being abused. I want to make sure we have an ethical government. I've served you with integrity on city council and as president, and I will continue to do so as mayor. And I believe in accountability, being accountable to you, the people we serve, and holding people accountable when they don't. Again, my name is Felicia Moore. I want to be our next mayor. Join us, Felicia Moore, for mayor.com.